very pleased to welcome Sven uh, from Dublin, who will talk about bimodal peripheral nerve stimulation as an avenue to treat neurological disorders. Sven. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, Hert, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm not an engineer, so I was a little bit confused when I got the invitation. I sent him an email saying, are you sure you want to invite me? Uh, but he really want me, uh, wanted to, to uh, talk to me about uh, peripheral nerve stimulation, so that's what I'm going to do today. So if we look at the brain, we have these brain nuclei that are really central in a lot of diseases. We have the locus cerebellus norepinephrine pathway. We have the ventral tegmental dopaminer dopaminergic pathway, the raffin nucleus serotonergic pathway, and the nucleus basalis uh, cholinergic pathway that play a key role in different neurologic and neuropsychiatric diseases. And we know if something goes wrong down these pathways, we can develop specific neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders. We have different approaches to basically directly try to modify the brain uh, using the brain stimulation or surferic electrodes or transcranial magnetic stimulation to directly uh, change activation in the brain and also indirectly sometimes activate one of these pathways. But there's more and more interest also for peripheral nerve stimulation. And one in specific is the vagus nerve stimulation. It's already used quite common for people that have epilepsy or depression that do not respond to any other treatment. And it seems to be quite successful. But what is interesting is that peripheral nerve stimulation has a lot of potential, but it's not only the vagus nerve. Today I want to talk about vagus nerve stimulation, but also trigeminal nerve stimulation and occipital nerve stimulation, and how they could help potentially uh, different neurological and neuropsychiatric uh, diseases. And I will first talk about the vagus nerve. So, what is interesting about the vagus nerve is that when you stimulate the vagus nerve, that it actually activates a nuclei in the brain stem, the nucleus tractus solitaris, that has connections with all these other brain nuclei, sorry, um, that induce the release of these neuromodulators. We also know that we can actually activate the vagus nerve in a non-invasive way. You have an auricular branch in the ear, in the concha, that can activate uh, the vagus nerve. The problem is that it's not quite clear if we're only activating the vagus nerve because, as you can see, there's a lot of nerves close to it. You have the trigeminal nerve that's next to it. You have uh, the occipital nerve that is also very close to it. Uh, you have a branch of the facial nerve that's also very close to it. Anyhow, what we know is that if you activate the concha uh, within your ear, you activate definitely also the vagus nerve and it induces a lot of brain changes. But it's one thing to basically activate all these brain areas and induce these changes and potentially induce neuroplasticity. But of course, it spread all over the brain. But a couple of years ago, our group was able to show that if you pair vagus nerve stimulation together with a sensory task, and in this case, it was an auditory stimuli that we presented, that you can actually target or drive plasticity in a very specific way. And we set up an experiment where we had uh, rats that we basically exposed to noise exposure, and they developed tinnitus. And it's quite easy to test them by using a gap detection uh, method to see if they developed tinnitus. Those animals were assigned to one of those three groups. One group basically just perceived tone therapy, meaning they just were hearing different types of frequencies with the exception of the tinnitus frequency. Another group of animals received just vagus nerve stimulation. And then a third group got basically the paired uh, situation where we basically pair vagus nerve stimulation together with tone therapy. And what we saw was actually in those animals that we couldn't normalize neural activity in comparison to the other two groups, and that those animals after the treatment had no tinnitus anymore in comparison to the two other groups. So it seems that pairing vagus nerve stimulation together with sensory uh, input, in this case auditory stimuli, that we can actually really target and induce plasticity in a very specific uh, way. In addition to that, we were also sh uh, able to show that actually we could normalize the map. We know that the auditory cortex is uh, organized in a tonotopic way and that uh, 
you can basically see from lower frequencies up to higher frequencies that it's organized in a very specific way. And that in tinnitus and animal, animals that have tinnitus, that you get an overrepresentation of certain frequencies uh, on that map. But after paired stimulation, that map normalized again and is closely to actually before noise exposure. So this suggests that it actually has a lot of potential. So we went and developed a device together with microtransponder that allows us to stimulate the vagus nerve, but at the same time communicate with a computer so that we could pair auditory stimuli generated by the computer and uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. And this was just an efficacy study where we basically implanted, and it was a multi-center trial, there were four uh, centers involved here in the US that were involved in that trial, and about half of the people that were enrolled in the study were assigned to the paired treatment, and half of them were the control group and uh, received the unpaired treatment. The treatment was for, six, uh, for 12 weeks, but at six weeks we had an interim uh, analysis, and what was also different was that for the control group, after six weeks, they would cross over and receive the pair treatment. Our primary outcome measure was the tinnitus handicap inventory, which is a typical measure for tinnitus severity. And we know that the drop of seven points on uh, the THI is actually clinical meaningful for patients. What was the exact difference between the two arms? So for arm one, we paired auditory stimuli together with a burst of uh, stimulation on the vagus nerve. And we presented different types of tones randomly uh, with the exception of the tinnitus tone and a notch of uh, half an octave above or below uh, the tinnitus tone. Every 30 seconds, we stimulated uh, the vagus nerve, uh, which was a burst of five, uh, 15 spikes together with a tone. And patients had to do that for two and a half hours a day for 12 weeks in a row. The control group basically got also two and a half hours of uh, training, but the difference was that they got 15 minutes of just auditory stimuli, followed by two hours of vagus nerve stimulation, and then again, 15 minutes of uh, auditory stimuli. To our surprise, if we compared ARM1, that basically was the paired treatment, with the unpaired treatment in ARM2, both groups actually generated an effect that was clinical meaningful. You could see that there was a drop that was higher than, uh, or that was more than seven points than what was uh, that is needed for the medical clinical outcome. So, but both groups dropped more or less at the same rate. If you look at 12 weeks, remember after uh, week six, the people in the unpaired group now also receive pair treatment. No effect was generated anymore. We see a fast acting effect, but it does really matter if it's paired or unpaired. In both groups, we got an effect. What was a little bit more encouraging was that if we look at the electrophys, we saw that actually there was a change in the auditory cortex and that we saw a reduced power or decreased power activity in the auditory cortex after treatment for the gamma frequency band. And we know that the gamma power it correlates with how loud people perceive their tinnitus. At the same time, we saw that there was increased alpha activity within that auditory cortex, which is normally what you would expect uh, at rest in healthy controls. In addition to that, we saw that there was reduced lack of phase coherence between the auditory cortex and uh, frontal areas that are related and have been shown to be related to tinnitus-related distress. So it could be that the effect that VNS was generating was just more related to the mood component than the tinnitus itself. One explanation for that is maybe that VNS is very good for, mood, for modifying the mood component if we look at positive symptoms but that it could actually help for negative symptoms if you pair it with another treatment. So in another uh, feasibility to, uh, efficacy trial, we enrolled uh, 21 patients that had ischemic stroke that had upper limb problems. And the idea was, let's compare people that just get regular PT with people that get PT paired with vagus nerve stimulation. So every time that they were successful and executing a task, we would at the same time stimulate their vagus nerve. 
And what was interesting was that in, if we compare those two groups, that actually the people that got vagus nerve stimulation paired with PT were more successful, although it was close to significant but not significant, um, um, in comparison to people that just got PT. This was only a small trial, and now we're doing a phase three trial where we enroll 130 patients, and so far it seems to be quite interesting, uh, the effects that we are generating. At the same line of interest, again for negative symptoms, if you look at spinal cord injury that we induce in animals, what is interesting, if we pair vagus nerve stimulation with basically pulling force and the, mo the 20 percent most successful trials in pulling force and pair with vagus nerve, we see that recovery in those animals that had spinal cord injury is going a lot faster than basically just rehab or if you pair vagus nerve stimulation with the bottom 20% of uh, pulling force. Uh, so it seemed that pairing is doing something, but it's not quite clear when it's doing something and when, not, uh, when it's not helping at all. Um, but at the same time, what we're trying to do now, because, well, it's just a pain to implant all these patients with a big IPG and an electrode, we try to basically make it smaller nowadays, uh, that you just have the electrode and all the wiring is gone, and basically the battery is not implanted anymore, and you can basically connect it to an iPhone or a smartphone and uh, generate the pulses from your smartphone. So that's something that we're working on right now. Anyway. That's for vagus nerve stimulation. But all these nerves are probably related to each other, but we're not 100% sure about the physiology of these nerves. But if you look at the trigeminal nerve, there's also some interest. We know that transcranial direct uh, current stimulation and transcranial direct alternating current uh, stimulation got a lot of buzz, and it was quite successful for a whole list of indications. But actually, the last two years, there's a lot of controversy about direct current stimulation and alternating current stimulation that is probably not directly stimulating the brain. There was one paper published by Bazaki that was saying that actually 75% of the current doesn't go to the brain and it's just shunned away. But there's another paper done by a group in Leuven that actually suggests that uh, transcranial direct current stimulation and transcranial alternating current stimulation is probably stimulating peripheral nerves rather than the brain itself. So it could be that a lot of the effects that we're seeing with TDCS and transcranial alternating current stimulation are actually still there, but that the explanation is not because we're directly uh, modifying the brain, but through peripheral nerve stimulation, and in this case, trigeminal nerve stimulation. We had a different setup based on the vagus nerve ID where we stimulate the tongue. The tongue, has, uh, the, the tongue ending has also a trigeminal nerve ending, and the idea is to do the same thing like for the vagus nerve. We stimulate the tip of the tongue and at the same time pair it with auditory uh, stimuli. So we had three groups. Uh, and in each group, we had at least 100 people enrolled. And very similar to the design that we have for the vagus nerve stimulation, they received the treatment for 12 weeks. At six weeks, we have an interim analysis. And then we follow them up. And that was different than for the vagus nerve study for 12 uh, months after treatment. Again, the primary outcome measure was the tinted sanican inventory, and that's uh, measuring how severe the tinnitus is. And seven points drop on the THI is actually clinical meaningful. What was the difference between uh, the different arms? In arm one, we basically paired auditory stimuli with tongue stimuli, and now we didn't care uh, about the tinnitus tone. We just presented all possible auditory tones in comparison to uh, what we did in the vagus nerve uh, situation. In ARM2, we actually did the same thing as ARM1, uh, as ARM1 with the exception that there's a small lag between the auditory stimulus and the tongue stimulus that we presented. And in ARM3, there's a huge delay between the auditory stimulus that we present and the tongue stimulus that we present, and in addition, we only present low frequency tones. Very similar to vagus nerve, what we saw is that actually independent of the group, we got a significant drop uh, after 12 weeks of treatment. And that the drop was actually twice the minimal clinical important difference for uh, tinnitus patients. 
But I think what was even more important was the long-term follow-up. So what we see is that very similar to vagus nerve stimulation is you have a fast-acting effect. After six weeks, you already have a huge effect, and then it stabilizes a little bit. So we continue with the treatment for another uh, six weeks, but more or less you get the same effects. But then we follow them up for 12 uh, months, and what you do see is that the people that were assigned to ARM1 actually have a better effect, a significant better effect than the people in ARM3, where you had a huge delay between the auditor stimulus and the tone stimulus, and uh, the auditor stimuli were only low frequencies. The ARM2 that is actually closer related to ARM1 than ARM3 was floating somewhere in between. So it seems that the pairing is important, but only long term. Of course, for the vagus nerve study, we didn't follow them up for such a long time, so it could be that the effect was only generated after a longer uh, time. So this is quite interesting. Does it mean that there was no mood component related? Well, there's actually a group in uh, Brazil that is also trying to stimulate the trigeminal nerve. They do not stimulate the tongue, but basically they stimulate uh, the upper uh, the upper branch of uh, the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic uh, branch of the uh, trigeminal nerve for depression, and they just stimulated it uh, for 10 days in a row, and after two weeks they already see an effect between the sham group and the active group on uh, depression. So there's definitely also a mood component related to it. It's not just pure the tinnitus stone, uh, but it could also be that there's a mood component that is also uh, modified. Anyway. So we have the vagus nerve, we have the trigeminal nerve that more or less shows similar results. Another nerve that is less of interest to most researchers is the greater occipital nerve. It's the nerve on the back of your head that sends information, uh, pain information and sensory information uh, to your brain. There are people that are actually trying to stimulate that in an invasive way, and it's a very easy procedure to do. It's just a wire electrode that you inject. You can do it basically under local anesthesia. You do not do, have to do it a full-blown uh, surgery. And it's shown to be effective for migraine and cluster headache. There's other groups that are doing the same approach, but they're stimulating the trigeminal nerve and basically stimulate the opt ophthalmic branch of uh, the trigeminal nerve to get similar results. We also tried it, but now not just for uh, migraine of cluster headache, but for people with um, bodily spread brain uh, or fibromyalgia. So we implanted them, again, with a wide electrode in the neck, and you can see that there's a lot of change that you generate when you stimulate the greater occipital nerve. What was interesting is that we, ha we had very strong effects if you look at the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire, the pain vigilance uh, awareness questionnaire, and the uh, numeric rating scale for pain. Um, but of course, we wanted to see if we can also do it in a non-invasive way. So we used a uh, transcranial alternating current with the idea that we're stimulating actually peripheral nerves and not directly the brain. And we could generate the same effect as for the implanted uh, approach. So this is quite interesting that with a non-invasive way, we could suppress pain in these people with uh, chronic fibromyalgia. Another group in Michigan, led by Susan Shore, did the same thing, was stimulating the greater occipital nerve, but now was pairing it with auditory stimuli, similar to what we did for trigeminal nerve stimulation and for vagus nerve stimulation. And they showed in patients with tinnitus, and this was just a small study, that actually the people that were in the active group had a good response or a good suppression of their tinnitus percept. Suggesting that again, more, uh, independent of the nerve that we're stimulating, that we are able to generate the same effects. But it's less known about the physiology of the greater occipital nerve and how it works. There is some preliminary evidence or anecdotal evidence that suggests that actually the greater occipital nerve is also connected to the nucleus tractus solitaris and from there is activating these brain nuclei and basically induce the release of these neurochemicals. This is the only study I could find that shows that actually C2 has dense connections to the nucleus tractus solitaris. And that, that's the only thing that we know. So 
we try to do it in the scanner. We stimulate the greater occipital nerve and try to see what is, what is happening in the locus cerebellus, the ventral tegmental area, uh, the raphe nucleus, and the nucleus basalis, and we can see that in the active group, you see increased activity within these areas, suggesting that we're stimulating the similar pathway like for vagus nerve stimulation. What was of really of interest to us is can we also induce behavioral changes? And we know that the locus cerebellus is really important and a key area in developing new memories. There's a whole literature on that that show that if you activate the uh, nucleus tractus solitaris uh, up to the locus cerebellus, that there's a direct connection with the hippocampus and the amygdala, and that it plays a key role in actually uh, developing memories. And Clark already showed that in people with epilepsy, um, that uh, vagus nerve stimulation can improve memory recognition. So our question was, well, can we also induce that by uh, stimulating the greater occipital nerve? So we did a very easy task where uh, students had to learn faces. We showed them 150 faces and also showed them a name. So this person, uh, her name is Amber, this person's name is Douglas. And we asked them if it's a male or female. That was not really important for the task. It was just to be sure that they pay attention to the task. We waited for 15 minutes, and then we showed them basically the same images and also new images. And we just asked them, is this an old or a new face? And if it's an old face, what's the name of that person? What we did during what we call the encoding phase, when they were learning those faces, we stimulated the greater occipital nerve. These are the results. What was interesting is that the group that was in the active group in comparison to the sham group was actually able to remember more uh, old faces than um, the sham group. For the new faces, we couldn't see an effect. But also we could see that the people that received occipital nerve stimulation during the encoding phase were able to recognize more names than the sham group. And this is a recognition test. So it's still easy because basically we give them cues uh, to see if they remember uh, that phase or not. So we thought, let's make it a little bit more challenging. And keep in mind, these are done in college students. So we think, well, or at least I assume that they're already at the top of their game. Um, so we looked at a different task. And there was a task developed by Rodiker that was published in, in Science that showed actually the way that we learn is be, uh, or the best approach to learn things is that we study, we test ourselves. We study, we test ourselves. And we do that over and over and over again. And that's the best way to learn. And he designed a specific task. And it's a word association task where people basically have to learn the English, English translation to Swahili words. And it's done in four blocks. And every time, basically, they get exposed to 75 words. And we show them the Swahili word and the English word. And then after, after they've done that, we test them. And we basically just show them the Swahili word and ask them what is the English translation of that Swahili word. But we make it a little bit more challenging. Rudiger showed that in one specific condition, that actually, if you only test them for the words that they did not remember in the previous block, that it's actually a lot harder to remember. So for instance, in the first block, we showed them 75 words, and you're already able to remember 15 words uh, in that first block. In the second block, we're go only going to test you for 60 words. So those 15 words that you already remember, we're not going to test you on that. And people are actually quite have a hard time to remember those words long term. So we did this uh, design. And every time during the study phase, we were stimulating the greater occipital nerve. We waited for seven days, and then they came back, and we just tested them how many English translations of Swahili words did they remember. On the left side, you see basically the learning phase, so during day one. And you can clearly see that, independent of stimulating the greater of civil learner or using a sham, they learned the same amount of words. But if they come back seven days later, what we saw was that the people that received the stimulation actually were a lot better at remembering the English translation of Swahili words than the sham group. And it's about 15% better that they were doing. So this is quite impressive for a young group of college students.
but we wanted to be sure that it's just stimulating the occipital nerve, that it's not just a sensation effect, and so on. So we tried to do the same effect in animals. We implanted animals targeting, uh, with a cuff electrode, the occipital nerve. And we did two experiments. And one experiment, we basically uh, did an object recognition task. So animals were exposed to objects and um, for half an hour. And then uh, we looked how much time they spent basically looking or smelling those objects. And then immediately afterwards, we were stimulating the greater occipital nerve in one group. And in the other group, it was just uh, the sham. So we were not stimulating the occipital nerve. We waited for 24 hours, and then we did the same task. And we just looked at how much time they spent smelling old objects versus new objects. And what we saw was that during the acquisition time, where they were learning the task, there was no difference. But 24 hours later, it was clear that they were spending a lot more time looking at the new objects or smelling at the new objects than the old objects, suggesting that they were able to remember those old objects, which fits with our human data. We did a second task where we did inhibitory avoidance. So animals like to stay in the dark. Uh, but every time that they would go in that dark space, they got a, a, food, a food shock. So we trained them. And then immediately after the task, we stimulated the occipital nerve for half an hour. And then again, uh, we tested them 24 hours later. During the acquisition time, we see that the, both animals, uh, both groups basically spent the same amount of time in that dark space. But during the retention time, 24 hours later, those animals that got occipital nerve stimulation tried to avoid that dark room for a longer time than the shine group. Again, suggesting that we can actually improve memory using occipital nerve stimulation. I'm almost done, I think. Um, so at the same time that we were doing this task, we were also putting them in the scanner. And we were actually able to show that the active group, in comparison to the sham group, show more activity in the right hippocampus and the right amygdala during stimulation. And if we do a seed-based analysis, putting the seed in the locus cereus, what we see after stimulation is actually increased activity in the hippocampus, suggesting that there's increased connectivity or increased communication between the locus cereus and the hippocampus. We also did a Roy to Roy analysis where we looked at connectivity between the hippocampus and uh, the amygdala and the hippocamp and the locus cerebrus, sorry, and the hippocampus and the locus cerebrus and the amygdala. And what we saw was during stimulation, you see increased connectivity for the active group in comparison to the sham group. And after stimulation, there was still increased connectivity in between the locus cerebrus and the hippocampus. The final experiment was to be sure that there actually there was release of norepinephrine. We only showed that there's activity changes in the locus cerebrus and hippocampus. So we looked at pupil dilations, and we looked at a specific biomarker, which is nor, uh, alpha amylase, which is a biomarker for the re release of norepinephrine. So what we've done is uh, we compare them before and after. And what we see is that for the active group, we see indeed increased pupil size, and we know that's related with norepinephrine activity. And in addition, during stimulation and after stimulation, what we also saw was increased alpha amylase release for the active group in comparison to the sham group. That is an indication for the release of norepinephrine. And we were also able to show that actually there's a correlation between pupil size and the release of norepinephrine measured by alpha amylase. Anyway, to go uh, one step back, it seems like stimulating one of these peripheral nerves can generate more or less the same effect. And that depending how we stimulate, if we pair it with a task, that actually can help a lot of potential neurological disorders. And what I think, uh, and what I think has a lot of potential is when we stimulate those peripheral nerves, if we use specific parameters that we could potentially activate these specific brain nuclei in a very specific way. And I think that's one of the next steps that we want to do to see if using specific parameter, uh, parameters, if we can activate one of these areas more than the other one and basically help specific neurological disorders. That's it. I thank you. Thank, thanks very much. The, the hypothesis is very heavily focused on uh, activating neural systems that enhance 
cortical and hippocampal attentional mechanisms. So this mm -hmm. is really a heavy focus on attention. But what about the, the internal, sorry about the anterior cingulate cortex, and what about insula? Because really much of what could be reported is, a, is, a much, is an awareness piece mm -hmm. as much as is an attentional piece. So what about, I saw in the, in the occipital nerve stimulation, it looked like activity in insula was reduced on that one panel, lower left-hand panel in one of your slides. Have you looked at, I guess the question is, have you looked at insula and have you looked at an, posterior and anterior cingulate? Mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't look at the insula and the posterior uh, cingulate. We looked at the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, uh -huh. which is actually correlated with the insula because it's part of the salience network. So it could be that there's also an attention component to it. If you basically look at pain, we know that the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex together with insula is part of your medial pain pathway. That seems to be really important in chronic pain. And that actually, it's sometimes more important to change that network instead of just the somatosensory right. cortical activity. Right, I mean, in FADA we'll talk about this, but you know, this, the practice of meditation frequently engages vagal tone. Mm -hmm. And so you wonder whether the mechanism that's being pursued is one that's also basically engaged through meditational practice. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about that? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I know. Uh, I thought about it a little bit. I agree. I think you can definitely, with meditation, can basically activate these same networks. And I think, yeah. for instance, for pain, where we know that we activate that the attention network is important, but uh, it's also possible that if you change the attention network that you actually can draw your attention away from the pain. Yes. And that's very similar to what you can do with mindfulness. The pain is, not, is still there. Mm -hmm. And with tinnitus, it's the same thing, yeah. actually. A lot of people say, I have tinnitus, but I don't care about it because I do not pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Other people are heavily focused on it yeah. and potentially meditation or directly stimulating the anterior cingulate cortex. And we did a study where we basically targeted the anterior cingulate cortex. And the only thing that people were saying was actually, well, I can see it, uh, I can still hear my tinnitus, but I don't care about it mm -hmm. anymore because mm -hmm. I'm paying attention to other things nowadays. So definitely there could be a link. Really interesting. Other questions, please. Gert. Very nice presentation. So um, the, the bottom line seems is that um, much of those stimulation strategies are directed towards the peripheral nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that begs the question, so other modalities, right? So with the peripheral nervous system, you get into the midbrain before I guess you can go through the rest of the, of the nervous system. So then wouldn't other modalities like auditory stimulation perhaps be equally effective if it's correctly done in the right phase, say with your mm -hmm. measured EEG signal or so? Mm -hmm. um, well, we know in tinnitus that it's not that effective. So if you do, for instance, auditory discrimination tasks, uh, it's not very effective in tinnitus. So I think it's the pairing that is essential. Yeah, that is, a, that is more essential. So just doing auditory stimuli, stimulation, they tried it over and over again. It doesn't seem to help that much. Even for cochlear implants, the effect that is generated is probably the masking of the tinnitus rather than actually removing the tinnitus. or even actually electrical stimulating the cochlea rather than actually uh, eliminating the tinnitus. So it's just giving sensation to the cochlea. Those are the two assumptions. So. Uh, yes, I don't know anything about neuroscience. However, I have a one question. Um, in humans, sometimes it happens become um, vegetable uh, existence. You mean there is no response? He's, she or a patient is alive, but it's no response at all. Sometimes music therapy works well. Is it maybe not a peripheral area of the brain? Mm -hmm. But can you explain something about how it's, we can stimulate or some, especially the, uh, the songs or music? If the patient is very familiar 
and uh, very favorable, fa favor, uh, music uh, wake up. Mm -hmm. I heard of that and I read of, uh, about it. So, mm -hmm. well, it's very hard to explain why p some people respond and other people do not respond. We also see it for tinnitus. Some people respond, other people do not respond. For tinnitus, the strategy is basically we try with one therapy, then we go to the next one, the next one, the next one, until one works. Why some people respond to a certain treatment and others do not, we're in the dark about that. So we have no clear idea about that. So you don't want to do such a <laughs> I'm interested in doing that and doing that, but it's basically, for t for tinnitus research, is the holy grail, basically, because that would ba make us able to predict, oh, you're this type of patient, this is the ideal treatment. And now basically we try 20 treatments at the same time, uh, try 20 treatments and then hopefully one will work. So. Good, yes. I'll bring the microphone to you. So I'm a clinician and I accidentally came across something that stopped tinnitus. Mm -hmm. So Rodolfo Linus published back in the late 90s the thalamocortical dysrhythmia theory. Mm -hmm. And he said it was for depression, tinnitus, chronic pain, and Parkinson's. So I work with Parkinson's, and there's that high and low frequency coupling that's going on. Mm -hmm. You break that up, and a lot of the symptoms of Parkinson's abate. Mm -hmm. One of my Parkinson's patients had tinnitus, and I broke up the low and, freq low and high frequencies using neurofeedback, and within three sessions, it was gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was quite remarkable how all those tinnitus, pain, Parkinson's are all linked mm -hmm. with these frequencies. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, the problem is with tinnitus that we think that there actually are different subtypes and one could be explained through thalamocortical dysrhythmia that was introduced by Rodolfo Linus several years ago, but there's also an idea that for tinnitus in specific there's also a top-down type of tinnitus that has nothing to do with hearing loss or whatever and that there's basically a noise cancellation system that is not working that well. There's a whole literature about it by uh, Joseph Rorschacher that suggests that idea actually. So, and it could be for those group of patients that actually the approach would not help, but for people that have, for instance, hearing loss, and because of that, because that's the idea, you have hearing loss, and because of that, there's changing, there's a reduction of alpha activity, there's increase in theta activity and gamma activity, that basically, in the, in the thalamus, that is also projected to the auditory cortex, and that could be then an approach to basically, with neurofeedback, to reduce that gamma theta activity and increase alpha activity. Sven, thank you very much for a great presentation.